Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're just waiting a few minutes. Lynn Kohick is supposed to be joining us, and we're just giving her a minute to see if she'll be able to join us. In the meantime, just a quick note from SBL AAR tech support that um, you may see at the top of your screen. It says live on cost custom live streaming service. This is just a uh, automatically generated closed captioning service. It's not being live streamed anywhere else, um, but closed captionings are available, available at the bottom of your screen if you just put on show subtitles. Um, they do lag a few seconds because they are automatically generated by AI. Um, please do avail yourself of that. Um, and I will be here for any tech support for um, anyone answering questions as well. Great, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, we can't see you all joining us, but I'd like to welcome you to our first IVR Students event. We're really excited to have this conversation with Dr. Craig Keener. Um, my name is Melissa Barciela Mandela. I am the chair of IVR Students. And before I tell you a little bit about what IVR Students is, I'd like to invite Dr. Beth Stovell, the secretary of IVR, chair of membership and the board liaison for IVR students to offer an opening prayer for us. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity to, to grow and to learn, um, but also to, to be encouraged together. Uh, Lord, I pray for this time to be one of, of an increase in knowledge, a sense of growth together um, and getting to know each other. And Lord, I pray for this to be the first step of so many wonderful steps to come for IBR students. I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Beth. Uh, IBR students is a new initiative created just about a year ago with the support of the IBR board. And our vision is simply this, it's to support and encourage students, both at the master's and the PhD level, as we sort of navigate together biblical studies. Uh, we exist to help develop professional skills for students, help them to connect with senior level scholars, and to help bridge this gap that we sometimes feel between academia and the local church. Uh, if the student committee, Kevin and Jesse, if you would go ahead and introduce yourselves. I'm Kevin Boyle. I am in between degrees at the moment. Uh, I was supposed to be beginning a degree in Jerusalem in August, but uh, COVID has me taking an unintentional gap year, but it's okay because um, I'm at home. I'm receiving three hot meals a day and I don't have homework. So it's a blessing in disguise, I guess. And I'm Jesse Grenz. I'm the administrative assistant for IBR students. I am a fourth year PhD student at the University of Cambridge working in the field of New Testament textual criticism. I work on the fourth century manuscript Codex Vaticanus and studying all the fun bits of that manuscript. And so I'm grateful to be here today. Great, the three of us have been working the past few months. And so just thanks to them for uh, all the work they've put in to make this time possible for supporting our students. I'm Melissa, as I said, I'm also a student. Uh, I'm at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, originally from Florida. So it is quite cold. We had our first snow day today which is a strange sight for a South Floridian. Um, I'm working on a Master of Letters in Biblical Languages and Literature. And I'd now like to invite uh, IBR President, Dr. Lynn Koek. We're so glad that you could join us uh, to share a few words with us. Well, thank you. And thank you to the, the team, to Jesse, Kevin, and Melissa for putting this all together. Uh, I'm really grateful for that. I'm, I'm even grateful that I'm here because I misread the time and <laughs> I'm on mountain time right now. And uh, all of a sudden I was like, whoa, wait a minute. It's one o'clock Eastern. Anyway, uh, this you'll find that um, uh, the, the absent-minded professor does actually fit my... Uh, <laughs> who I am, sadly, or at least time, time zones confuse me. Anyway, uh, I'm so glad to be able to welcome you all um, to this event. I wish we were in person 
when uh, this idea first came to um, came to the attention of the board as as um, Melissa uh, and Jesse and Kevin had talked about having a coffee hour and all of that. I I was really looking forward to being able to meet uh, meet you individually and be able to talk. But um, I'm so grateful for this chance to even meet via Zoom um, and. You know, we just look forward to next year when we'll be able to be uh, face to face. I hope you find IBR to be a, a home for you. Um, this is a, a, a group that cares about each other, cares about scholarship for sure, but cares about each other, cares about the whole person and wants to encourage you in your studies, wants to be there in the ups and downs, which those of you in your studies uh, know uh, it can be kind of a roller coaster and, and we really want to be there for you. Uh, and then when you get your degree, notice I said when, um, we want you to, for this to be your home as you pursue scholarship and whatever occupation the Lord uh, places you in. Um, our, our board is a board I think that's innovative, that likes new ideas. And so as student members, please give us your ideas. You can send me an email, you've met uh, Beth now and um, certainly can can send her your ideas. We'd, we'd love to have you feel like this is your place as well. Um, and I hope that you will enjoy uh, um, the events that we have uh, next year in person. Um, but I'm very excited uh, that we have uh, Dr. Craig Keener who will be talking with us uh, today. Dr. Keener is just well, he's my hero. He knows that. Uh, he didn't, he's not wearing his cape today. He must, it's in the cleaners. It's probably at the cleaners now. Yeah, but he is I'm actually- sorry, super I'm, I'm incapable. <laughs> see, see how awesome he is? Yeah. So anyway, thanks very much, uh, Craig, for Dr. Keener, for being a part of, part of this. And again, just welcome. Welcome to IBR. And um, yeah, well, I'll turn it back to, to Melissa. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, we're very grateful for IBR and their support of the, the vision and the mission of IBR students. So thank you very much. And thank you, Beth, for all the support that you provided. Beth has definitely gone to bat for us a few times. And so we're very grateful for her and helping us make this happen. But it's now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Craig Keener as our guest for the very first IBR student gathering. Craig is FM and Ada Thompson Professor of Biblical Studies at Asbury Theological Seminary, where he has been teaching for nearly a decade. He was the most recent president of the Evangelical Theological Society and the former editor of IBR's very own Bulletin for Biblical Research. Dr. Keener received his PhD from Duke University, where he also TA'd for D. Moody Smith and E.P. Sanders. His dissertation focused on the spirit in John's gospel, a theme that has continued to be a significant factor throughout his writing career. Craig has published 32 books and numerous articles that I could not count. He wrote the award-winning IVP Bible background commentary for the New Testament and individual commentaries on many books of the New Testament and more are coming. Uh, published them with Baker Academic, Cambridge University Press, IVP, Eerdmans, Zondervan, uh, and more. And most famously is his fourth uh, four-volume commentary on Acts, totaling over 4,500 pages. But thankfully, CUP has published an abridged version that's only 714 pages. So if you don't have time for the four-volume set, then you can at least have a look at the CUP version. His other books include uh, and explore the credibility of miracle accounts in the New Testament. He looks at the historical Jesus, the role of women in ministry, the New Testament teachings on divorce, biblical and modern understandings of the spirit. And most recently, he has focused on the gospels as Greco-Roman biographies. And we have two commentaries to look forward to one next year on One Peter with uh, Baker Academic and uh, a future volume or more on 
Mark for ICC commentary series. In addition to his research and writing, Craig is an ordained minister in the National Baptist Convention, a predominantly African-American denomination. And most importantly, I'm sure Craig would agree, he is married to Dr. Medine Masunga Keener, who is from Republic of Congo and received her PhD in Paris, where she, and now she teaches French. Together, they published their incredible story in the book, Impossible Love. It's a great book that I would suggest everyone read. It is their passion to provide support for ethnic reconciliation in the US and Africa. And Craig and Medine are parents to David and Karen. Thank you, Craig, for being willing to join us today. I am sure I'm not the only one here who has been greatly influenced by your scholarship, as Lynn has already mentioned. So we look forward to hearing from your experiences, not only in the academy, but also in ministry and service to the church. Thank you, Craig. Just as a brief preview for this time together, keeping with the mission of IBR students, I thought I would give a little outline of how we decided to break up these questions. So we thought we would ask a few questions about autobiographically, how you, uh, how you came to study the Bible and New Testament. Then uh, with the mission of IBR students, we're very interested in your spiritual life and how the academy and the church come together in your research and writing and in teaching and ministry. And then finally, some very practical questions about your research habits, which I think many people are intrigued by uh, because of how proficient you are in all of your writing and research. So with that, I will turn it over to Melissa for questions. So why don't we just go ahead and start at the beginning, Dr. Keener. Uh, we all have stories of how we ended up interested in biblical studies and on this academic journey. So how did you become an academic? Is it something you knew from earlier on in, in your life or is it something you discovered later? I think we're all interested to, to hear. Uh, thank you so much. I, I do wanna say before uh, going on with that, what a privilege it is for me to be here. Uh, I'm at the age now where the um, the most exciting and fun thing I can do is, is try to um, pass things on to the rising generation because you're the ones who are going to carry things on. And I do have to admit, uh, I'm really more absent-minded than, than Lynn. I don't know, uh, comparatively speaking, she's not very absent-minded, but um, she, she wrote a great Ephesians commentary, by the way. So... My, my background, there was a sense in which I was interested in academia. I, I always was interested in learning. But, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be everything. You know, I wanted to be an astronaut. Although the, uh, you know, those tests they give you in school, they said, no, you can't be an astronaut. Um, I wanted to be a scientist for sure. I, I either wanted to be a paleontologist or an astrophysicist. But I really loved archaeology too. So I, I, I wasn't very good at narrowing things down. But I wanted truth. I wanted to know what made the universe work. I wanted to know what made me work. And I was really scared because I was reading Plato and Plato got me thinking about the immortality of the soul. But I wasn't persuaded by the arguments he gave in support of the immortality of the soul. So I knew I wasn't pre-existent. And since I wasn't pre-existent, then I wasn't immortal by his definition. And it seemed like my own existence was an infinitesimal improbability based on my purely naturalistic assumptions. So I, you know, I was kind of balancing two contradictory epistemological approaches in my mind. I was completely empiricist on the one hand, and I was completely idealist on the other. And those didn't come together until I became a Christian uh, and found the right place for each of those approaches. But uh, one, one worldview that I thought couldn't possibly be true was Christianity. So 
so my academic interests and my biblical studies interests weren't uh, coalescing at all at that point. I, I gave Christianity maybe a 2% chance of being true. And my, my reason wasn't very good. It was that 80% back then, it was 80% of the people in the US claimed to be Christian. And yet I couldn't tell by how most of them lived that they took it seriously. And I figured if they didn't take it seriously, why should I, as an atheist, take it seriously? But I didn't want to stake all of eternity on a 2% chance. Some people brought me the gospel. I argued with them for 45 minutes. And then I had a radical encounter with the Holy Spirit. And that uh, wasn't part of my epistemological plans, <laughs> but uh, God's own presence was so real that there was no way I could, I could deny it. I either had to accept him or reject him. And so, you know, I wasn't that stupid. <laughs> I accepted him. But on the other hand, I still had all these burning intellectual questions. So it started me on a quest um, for understanding and realizing that there was special revelation as well as general revelation, realizing that I could learn about the reality of God from the Bible, what God had revealed to us in history. I just began, I mean, the little kids in Sunday school knew more about the Bible than I did. So I started cramming and to, to catch up. And I found out if you read 40 chapters of the Bible a day, you can get through the New Testament every week or you can get through the Bible every month. Now, I didn't do that all the time, but as I did it, you know, when I, when I was first converted, I learned some Bible memory verses that, that people gave me. But quickly I learned that it wasn't just these main verses, so to speak, with a lot of blank spacing between, there was a context. And as I kept reading, I realized that the authors were taking for granted certain things that they and their audience shared that they weren't bothering to explain to people in the 20th century. Back then it was the 20th century. Um, not, not least, of course, that they were speaking Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic. So, I began to, uh, I just had a craving, I developed a craving for, for the background. I was um, learning Greek, learning Hebrew, Greek came faster, that's one reason I'm in New Testament rather than Old Testament. Uh, those of you who are in Old Testament or do both, I mean, I teach both, but sometimes, but um, those of you who are really good with Hebrew and Semitic languages, I respect your intelligence far, far beyond my own. Uh, but eventually I got, I got Hebrew much better, especially narrative. But th this quest for, for understanding more of the background, uh, I had one professor who was really interested in that. Also, I was in Pentecostal circles. Now, I, I shouldn't say this about all Pentecostal circles, but the Pentecostal circles I was in back then, they were really, they really nurtured me spiritually. But there were some of those circles where, you know, they did believe in some education, but, you know, the only real Pentecostal scholar we knew of that we ever, all of us knew about that we could look to was, was Gordon Fee. But also my professor, uh, Ben Aker was an example for me. And eventually um, I realized that what I felt called to do, which was to, um, bring people back to the scriptures. And, and, you know, I had this craving to understand the scriptures myself, that I could do it like he was doing it. You know, he was, he was teaching pastors. So he, he was teaching a lot of people who would teach other people. And just as I was going on, I ended up with getting a PhD along the way at, at Duke University. And by then I had like 70,000 index cards of this information I'd taken from ancient sources. And uh, th there was a day when we couldn't do all this on computer. We had to actually use index cards, which is tedious because what if you have information that should be filed in multiple places? How do you do that with index cards? Anyway, I'm, I'm probably taking too long on this one question, but um, mine was a circuitous route, not, not a, a normal route, but that's, um, that's how I got interested in it. When, with the 70,000 index cards, by that point, I, I said, you know, 
I wouldn't have had to do all this work. I would have just gone out and preached if, if I could have had all the background, you know, at my fingertips. And so if, if nobody else writes a background commentary, uh, you know, just as a, a, a side cheat sheet, uh, if nobody else writes that before, before I finish my doctorate, then I'll go ahead and, and anyway. Great. I always think that I have a lot of index cards of Hebrew and Greek vocabulary, but I'm not anywhere near 70,000. So, so that's really impressive. Um, what are some of the greatest challenges that you'd say you've faced as an academic and how did you overcome them? And you can share as many or as few as come to mind. Thanks. Different aspects of being an academic, there have been different, um, different struggles. D during my doctoral work, most of my professors were very supportive, <laughs> very understanding of my um, need to become more mature. <laughs> but uh, there were there were some. There was one professor. He was noted for uh, publicly saying that any professor who said that they believed in God should be fired, because that was compromising neutrality rather than just being honest about where you're coming from. Uh, this particular professor, <clears throat> he, was, he was patient though, I should say that, because we would spend hours in his office going back and forth. I didn't understand back then how precious time is, but he was, um, but he would, he had come from a fundamentalist background and had reacted against it, but he'd kept the mindset. So everything was either or and, Anything having to do with God was on the or side. Uh, one of our Jewish professors called him a repressed fundamentalist, but we would debate for hours on end. He told me I was his most encyclopedic graduate student. He also told another student that, uh, but he, uh, but I said, you know, if it had been up to you, I wouldn't have been allowed into the program, would I? He said, well, I have no, I don't control who gets into the program. Um, but one day he told me, and this was, I think I was working on my dissertation, you might not be allowed to graduate, you're too openly religious. So um, there are those kind of obstacles. When I was looking for a teaching position, I did find that a lot of schools had, they were very committed to their denominational particulars <laughs> and I didn't fit into a lot of those because um, I just wanted whatever, you know, whatever the Bible said, I just wanted to go for truth, you know, and so that left me out of a lot of circles, but I mean, it's, it's all right, the Lord, the Lord takes care of it. Another, uh, am I just talking about obstacles right now? Yeah, so there was an SBL session that stands out in my mind. Now, again, most SBL sessions, including this one, <laughs> most SBL sessions are very friendly and uh, ecumenical and you know you, you sharing of ideas but there was this one historical Jesus session where they were doing a review of some books and a member of the Jesus seminar was was responding to um, my recent historical Jesus book and uh, now I look back I mean I, I did say some things about the Jesus seminar I can see why he would have been <laughs> it may have been my fault but anyway uh, in the book, but he he was like, you know, right off the bat, there are two kinds of scholars. There are genuine critical scholars and there are evangelicals. And evangelicals should not be allowed in the room with us. Um, happily, you know, SBL policies are very forthright now about, you know, be, be friendly, be fair, but <laughs> that was not the most pleasant experience I had. Um, so, there are those kinds of obstacles. There are some, some people who won't read your work because of ideological orientation. When I was in, uh, and it's more in some areas than in others. I mean, I found like an ACT scholarship, I found a lot of diversity of opinion, but, but fairness, I, I think in, in uh, Pauline scholarship, there's a lot of evangelical voices there. In, in historical Jesus scholarship, uh, it was definitely outnumbered. So um, we, we, need, we need some reinforcements there, but um, 
But there are some people who won't read you because they disagree with you or because they don't like with whom you published or something like that. But there are a whole lot of scholars who are very fair across the board who don't think in those binary terms. And um, I think one thing, I had a really thin skin when I started uh, because of some things I'd been through in my background on a personal level. Um, and so I needed to, uh, to mellow out. Just because somebody isn't persuaded by your argument doesn't mean it's a bad argument. Sometimes some people aren't willing to be persuaded by anything. Then again, you know, it is worth looking at your argument again uh, to see if there is a reason why, why somebody's not persuaded by it. So we need to be ready to, to adapt, to change based on learning new things, which I'm learning all the time. If I waited to publish anything until I, until I knew everything, never, never publish anything, but, um, but I do try to get it right the <laughs> first time and then uh, keep, keep improving as I, as I keep going forward. That's one thing E.P. Sanders told me. He said, um, you know, a lot of people, they freeze at the writing stage, just get something down and then revise it. I mean, before you turn it in, but <laughs> get something down that you can work with. And that's helpful for, for writing. And I've tried to follow that advice. I also tried to follow the advice of another mentor. If you publish too young, people won't pay attention to it. But uh, on the other hand, I've also found if you wait till too late, like if you wait till you retire to publish, how many years left do you have? So uh, yeah. So follow the example of, of Lynn and Beth. Yeah, those are two good examples. Um, what are some of the main issues, Dr. Keener, that you see or challenges that you think the next generation of, or the upcoming generation of evangelical scholars will face? academically, spiritually, or any kind of aspect that you see? Well, again, it depends on what area you're working in. But one of the, one of the issues that stands out to me, and you don't, uh, somebody else might give a completely different answer, but this one has exercised my attention for a while. In the US, evangelical has taken on a, the, the, the label evangelical has taken on a meaning that is not exactly what most of us mean when we're speaking of evangelical scholarship. So, um, you know, in the media where they say, that at least now they're saying 80% of white evangelicals, they're at least narrowing it down, they're not saying, Evangelical, 80% of all evangelicals, because if you narrow it down to white evangelicals uh, and you're defining evangelical theologically, it's maybe more like 60% uh, voted a certain way. And not all the people who voted that way, I didn't vote that way, but not all the people who did vote that way voted that way for the same reasons. So there, I think there's an, a prejudice in some circles about what evangelical means. And we want our work to stand on its own. Like, uh, I don't wanna be a token evangelical, but neither do I wanna be stereotyped negatively based on what somebody thinks an evangelical is. Uh, so, you know, doing, doing good work. I, one of the professors at Duke, and, and the, this is not everybody's opinion, my, my doctoral supervisor was, was great, but one of the professors at Duke said that in, in biblical studies, evangelicals had to be twice as good as everybody else to get in and twice as good as everybody else to get out. I think that may have been hyperbole because um, there, were, there were people who, who didn't discriminate on those grounds. There probably were people who did, but, well, I know there were people who did, but anyway. Um, but I figured that's not a problem. If all I have to do is work twice as hard, then, I'll work twice as hard. Uh, it can be done. Um, but keeping that in mind, keeping in mind that the world is changing. So the needs of this new generation 
will be different. Actually, I think it's a more friendly world to evangelical scholarship than it was certainly a few generations ago. I mean, we're building on those who have gone before us. F.F. Um, F. Bruce, I. Howard Marshall, and others in the UK helped pave the way for a lot of evangelical scholarship there and in, in uh, other places. And as we're going into the next generation, the world is much more globalized and the need for theological education or, or Bible training on, on whatever level is, is just multiplying exponentially. But, um, you know, in, in say in the US, uh, a lot of um, freestanding institutions are, are closing down or, you know, they, they are trying to figure out what to do with their faculty because their student bodies are shrinking. But globally, the, the, the openings are so many. Now, those places may not all be able to pay the kind of salary you would get in the US, although most of them also, the uh, living cost is a lot lower. But um, there's, there's plenty that needs to be done. And uh, many, many schools globally who are still looking for, for people. Uh, but especially we need to be culturally sensitive as we go into those places to uh, know, hear from them what the needs are, uh, to plug in where they, they have uh, openings for people to plug in. And, and so on. So I'm, I'm probably talking too much, but. Not at all, it's very helpful. Uh, I'm gonna pass the mic to Kevin. He has a few questions about spiritual life and the academy. And as a uh, Christian Bible scholar and as an evangelical Bible scholar, as you've defined it, uh, just a few questions on how you view your uh, academic life in relation to the church. And I'll begin with this one, which is a favorite of many a first year Bible class in seminary or, or university. Uh, but I think many would love to hear how you understand the relationship between scholarship and your spiritual life, your life of faith, your devotion. Um, that's a huge question and one that you've written a monograph on, at least in part. Uh, but perhaps you could give us the short answer to that question and uh, some advice specifically for aspiring Bible scholars wrestling with how interpreting the Bible can be both a spiritual discipline and their profession? Well, I mean, when you're studying the Bible, how can it not be? <laughs> but, but, it, but we're trained kind of to separate those. And part of the training is helpful in that sometimes what we think is reading spiritually, we're just reading our own ideas into the text. Uh, we want to hear what the text is saying. So the Bible is more exciting to me now than it, than it ever was in the past. I mean, I, when I, I, learn, I learn so much more now because I'm hearing the text. Now, not all of, the, of my scholarship is that exciting because a lot of it is reading other ancient texts to learn the background. But when I, when I have that background and I come to the Bible, you know, it just is, is all the more open to me. When I, when I started as a young Christian, uh, I didn't have really good hermeneutics. Um, first time I read through Matthew, Matthew was great, but then I, I got to Mark and at the end of Mark, Jesus gets crucified and rises like he did in Matthew. And I'm like, wait a minute, how often is this gonna happen? I, I didn't realize, you know, how the Bible was written, you know, I, I just, people, after I became a Christian, they said, this is the word of God. So I thought, you know, it was dictated, you know, the way I would have taken the Quran or something. So I, I started learning, having to deal with genre and things. I didn't know the name for it at that point. And also, you know, I'd hear people quoting verses. So, you know, I'd learn these, these memory verses. And uh, one day I was uh, I was taking Latin. I was supposed to be translating Caesar's Gallic War. And I'm, I'm, I'm walking home from, from class. And I, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm a Christian now. I don't, I just want to read the Bible. And so 
I, I flipped open the Bible. This is the Bible. Let me flip open the Bible. Flipped open the Bible, stuck my finger down, and said, uh, and, and hoped I would it would land on a verse that said, "Forsake all and follow me." And then I wasn't going to have to do my homework. Instead, it said, "Render to Caesar what is Caesar's." So I did my homework. Now that was really out of context, <laughs> but the Lord got my attention. Uh, and I also had this idea, this is not the fault of the church that I was in, but some of the stuff that I was reading, um, you just had to get the revelation in your spirit. Now, the Bible does speak of the affective as well as the cognitive aspects of our personality. So like um, Romans 8 talks about the spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit. It also talks about the mind of the spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about praying with one's spirit and praying with one's understanding also. And both of them have to do with gifts of the spirit. So the spirit of God working with both. But I was only seeing one side of it at that point. And part of it was I was reacting against my pre-Christian intellectual snobbishness, saying, look, my mind had led me down the wrong path. So, um, but what I, you know, the problem wasn't my mind. The problem was it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. And I didn't have the fear of the Lord. And so I didn't have the right path to wisdom. Um, I had the wrong framework for understanding things. So um, I was like, you just have to get the revelation in your spirit. So I was praying about this and the Holy Spirit nailed me <laughs> and just flashed in my head a whole bunch of verses. I hadn't memorized them, but just a whole bunch of verses that I'd read about uh, the importance of understanding and the mind. And, you know, those who brought, brought forth good fruit in Matthew 13 were those who heard the word and understood it. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm wrong. So, and then uh, another key point I'd mentioned Ben Aker before was when I um, was taking his Romans class. I, I actually had been um, praying for him because people said, oh, he's too intellectual. So I started praying that God would wise him up to spiritual reality. And then the, I felt the Holy Spirit convict me. Uh, I've given him the gift of teaching. You need to listen to him. So I signed up for three classes with him the next semester. Um, and the class uh, on Romans, I'd be out praying and I'd hear something from the Holy Spirit. And then the next week, he'd say the same thing in class based on the text. And I was like, oh, wow, that's the Holy Spirit too. And I felt the Holy Spirit in Greek, in Greek class when he was teaching. So I realized, okay, uh, these things actually fit together better than I, better than I had supposed. But I still felt that tension because I was in circles where people were kind of divided, the spirit people and the word people. Now, what kind of division is that? I mean, if the Holy Spirit inspired the scripture, if we believe that. And, uh, and also, you know, I, I had another friend. This may not be relevant. It depends on your background. Some of you, this may sound like totally weird. But I had another friend who was having visions and all sorts of stuff. I actually was jealous of her, which wasn't very spiritual. But she was having visions, but she didn't read the Bible much because she said, look, they had their revelations. I get my own revelations directly from the Lord. Well, predictably, eventually, she got some wrong revelations that weren't, weren't biblical. And she said, oh, of course they're not biblical. This was just revealed last week. <laughs> and they were unbiblical. She eventually realized that and changed. But it was a lesson to me. I mean, in Jeremiah's generation, there were lots of people who said the Lord says, but, you know, a generation later, they knew who had spoken the truth. So Second Chronicles, Ezra, Daniel all say when the word of the Lord was fulfilled, according to the prophet Jeremiah, and you end up with, um, you end up with um, Jeremiah's book being the one that made it into the Bible. I don't know if the others wrote books, but just as a manner of speaking. Um, we need the objective to anchor us. We need the subjective or the experiential or the relational, because that's what the Bible is about. And the difference between 
um, the difference between scholarship that serves spiritual ends and scholarship that doesn't, in my mind, it's not, you know, that scholarship that serves spiritual ends should be subjective and just, you know, I mean, it's all subjective in a sense. And then, you know, it's subjective in the sense that we apply it, but not in the sense that we don't do good scholarship. But the, the difference is you do one with the fear of the Lord. Um, you know, we can all parse Greek verbs. We can all, uh, it doesn't take um, spiritual sense to, uh, to work with background. Uh, I mean, it may, it may your, your overall theological framework may affect what you do with it. It can't help but affect what you do with it. But there's a difference in the product in the sense that when you actually believe the message, you embrace it in a completely different way. So when the Bible talks about understanding the message, like in the Gospel of Mark that I'm working on now, the understanding isn't just having information. I mean, we need information. And as scholars, we want to dig in and, and provide more information. But it's also that we believe the message that, that God proclaims in the text. And the, the difference is there for the difference of faith. Um, we, we, we fear God, we trust God, and therefore we we want to understand the text. We desperately want to understand it rightly. And we want to hear what God had to say in it because we want to live our lives in subjection to, to his will. Thanks, Dr. Keener. That's really helpful for how each of us as scholars approach the text, as scholars ourselves. But uh, this next question is more about how we uh, how we approach the text with that understanding, with the, with the intended goal of, of sharing that with the church. So the question is, what are the best practices for grounding your research and writing questions in a way that is both relevant to scholarship, to SBL world, mm -hmm. and meaningful to the church? And uh, perhaps you could speak a little more broadly also about how you understand your academic vocation in teaching and writing uh, in relation to the church. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there are different worlds, so to speak. And so as much as I'm talking about integrating, um, we also do need to recognize those different, those different worlds, these, those different contexts in, in which we minister. So um, you can see this when Paul is, is preaching, for example, he preaches in, uh, well, in Acts 20, when he's talking to believers, he sounds a lot more like the Paul of his letters. But in Acts 13, he's speaking in a synagogue. He gives a good synagogue homily. Acts 14, he's preaching to farmers, talks about the, the God who gives us rain and fruitful seasons. In Acts chapter 17, uh, 22 through 31, he's He's speaking to um, the Areopagus, about 100 members of uh, city council in Athens. And a lot of them had some philosophic background. And, you know, of course, it's, he's been talking with Stoics and Epicureans, verse 18. So um, he, he quotes Greek poets. Now, he wasn't an expert in Greek poets. These are probably from cheat sheet, uh, cliff notes, uh, <laughs> whatever. But, uh, but, you know, he does his best to contextualize. And, and I think that uh, we also, there are contexts where the, the uh, common ground, um, Gary, Gary, Haber, Gary Habermas talks about minimal facts arguments. <laughs> there, there are contexts where, you know, the, the common ground, there's certain epistemological common ground, and we, we build on that. If we want to argue for something that's outside that common ground, we need to make a case for it. So, you know, meta-historical arguments like how we do historiography and so on, um, that usually doesn't come up, but, you know, when it does, we can deal with it. Uh, you know, somebody else brings up, hey, uh, this can't be true because it talks about a miracle. Well, you're the one who brought it up. Let's look at <laughs> whether miracles can happen or not. But um, 
but there's nothing wrong with, you know, we're discoursing in a setting where we're dealing with uh, certain kinds of historical questions. And we recognize here's the common ground we agree on. None of us believe only that that minimal shared common ground, but you know, by by dialoguing, we're agreeing to start with that, and um, yeah, and I think that's uh, we we can be willing to do that uh, in our in our dissertations, in our in our published scholarship, and so on. Um, we're not saying we don't believe anything else. We're just saying, you know, based on this this methodology, this is what we can say. But when we're talking to people who share more common ground, like in the church, then we can, um, like in a, when I'm explaining the text and the message of the text, uh, I'm doing a Wednesday night Bible study for our church. And if the message of the text is, look, Jesus, Jesus does these miracles, we can trust him for what, what is needed in our lives. I mean, it's not always that he's gonna say yes, but um, it's inviting us to a deeper faith. I mean, I can talk about that. That's the message of the text. And I don't have to say, that's the message of the text. Now we may or may not agree with that, but no, that's the message of the text. We're Christians. We want to agree with this. We want to, we want to hear what it's saying. So there are different contexts and it's all right to work with those different contexts. One thing we do need to keep in mind though is when I was doing my uh, first historical Jesus book, I was working with these uh, minimal assumptions. So at certain points, I, I was trying to just work with wherever I could find multiple attestation for material. Now, I, I have a, a doctoral student who recently did his dissertation on ancient biographies by uh, people who actually knew the people that they were writing about, knew them personally. So chances are they had a lot of information, but only about 5% of that information was multiply attested from other sources that have survived. So it doesn't have to be multiply attested to actually be accurate, right? But, um, but in, in that book, I was working with what was multiply attested. The problem is when you get into such a habit that it becomes a frame of mind. Afterwards, I would, I would, uh, you know, my wife would say something to me, and I was like, "Can you give me evidence in support of that assertion?" Now, my wife's PhD is in history, and uh, she wasn't even speaking as a historian, although she could have been. But she gave me, uh, sh she made it clear in no uncertain terms, very gently, that the testimony of a reliable witness is itself evidence. <laughs> and so sometimes that uh, minimalist framework, we need to keep it where it belongs. Uh, this, is, this is for certain, a certain epistemological framework, but we actually have a fuller epistemology than that. And, and almost everybody has a fuller epistemology than, I mean, people who are into scientism, who say that only what's empirically verifiable is true. They don't live like that. David Hume said that he couldn't live according to his, his, his epistemology outside of his study. You know, so empiricism is, is good in, in its place, but um, to say, well, um, my feelings of love, you know, to try to explain them as a neurochemical reaction, which I'm sure they are, but it's not just that. I mean, that's one way of looking at it, but that's not a very complete way of looking at it in terms of relationships. So all that to say, don't live by such a constrictive epistemology. Um, just just be, be wise, have a, um, a philosophic approach that is broad enough to accommodate complementary uh, complementary epistemologies. Thanks so much, Greg. I will pass the mic to Jesse, who has some questions about research. Yeah, thank you for those insightful comments. 
I think most of us here are, are very interested in how you actually do your research. How, how do you compile? I mean, you've already mentioned your, your note cards to us, which are, are famous. Um, so how do you actually, look at that. <laughs> um, how, how do you actually go about your research from start to finish? How, could you go a little bit into detail about your research process for one of your projects? Yeah, it's different now than with the index cards because, oh my, back then, oh, when I started, we didn't have computers, if you can believe that. And so I, I took the notes by hand. Once in a while, I, I'd stick it into a, my electric typewriter and type the notes, but usually by hand, which is why they're illegible to most other people. And then I would... Um, I would just take down any information as I'm reading through ancient sources that I thought would be relevant later to any part of the New Testament and some parts of the Old Testament just for fun. And I guess I'll pass those on to somebody else. But uh, so, so I, I get the research, then I, I put it in sequence. So I would arrange it according to where it would be useful. Now, sometimes it'd be useful for a bunch of different texts. So back then, what that meant was, if I had, um, if if the I was planning to write on John first, so I'd have John in the upper right-hand corner, uh, the reference, and then I have uh, the other references after it. But I'd have to finish my commentary on John and then refile the stuff, <laughs> uh, so I could I could make use of it in in other books. That was like tedious. With a computer, you just copy it in multiple places. And finally this year, see, I'm so far behind on technology. Finally, I found out, oh, you know, I'm copying all these things by hand or, or you know, typing them in. But uh, our library here, I actually have access to the Loeb Classical Library. I can copy and paste some of these things. And, and you can get books on Kindle often or uh, in accordance or Logos and I can copy and paste some of this stuff. I've been doing it all, typing it all. Makes you read it more carefully. But um, now, one thing I did though, that I'm glad I did, <clears throat> you, can, you can do word searches in Greek and Latin and, and so on and find a lot of things. But I read the things in their context. So I read through ancient sources. So I got their context. I got the feel for what they were saying. Part of, part of the difference in how you do research depends on what you're doing it for. In science, there's basic research and there's applied research. Basic research, say, say you're studying DNA or you're studying genetics, <clears throat> eventually you're gonna find cures for all sorts of things. Applied research, you're just targeting one thing, cancer or coronavirus or whatever. Um, so over the long haul, you'll find more things with basic research, but if you need a certain thing fast, you're gonna do applied research. Somebody's preparing for their sermon the night before, that's gonna be applied research. <laughs> but if I was just gonna be a, a teacher, I, I wouldn't have to do what I did, but I, I was looking at the long haul. Unfortunately, it was longer than I anticipated, but. I was looking at the long haul, so I just took notes on everything because I wanted to be, um, be able to understand everything in the Bible. Uh, I have too much research now. What slows me down now is not that I don't have enough index cards, it's because I have too many. And um, so I, I overdid it because I overestimated, I underestimated how long it would take me to publish all this stuff. So some of it's gonna to go to my doctoral students uh, eventually, but um, anyway, now I'm, I'm I, obviously I do things directly on computer, but um, so I have all this background stuff that's already done. Every time I'm about to write a new book, oh boy, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not leaving enough time. Um, I need to talk fast. No, that's, that's fine, yeah, keep going. Every, every time I'm writing a new book, um, say like when I was gonna do Galatians, 
I had a bunch of, of research already, but I needed to catch up on all the secondary literature, which I had, I had the secondary literature on most things up to about 1990, but uh, <laughs> I, had to, I had like 30 years to catch up, well, 25 years at that point to catch up on. That takes a while. Uh, abstracts helps a lot in terms of the um, articles, but you know, working through the commentaries and so on, and the same thing with First Peter. First Peter, I just said up front, because I couldn't do what I did on Acts. Acts took me like 10 years. I, I you know, if, if I'm going to live to 120, I can do that. But <laughs> otherwise, I can't do what I did on Acts. And even then, I mean, I only got like half of what could have been gotten if you wanted to cite everything. So, but, but there's also something else. Some things will come up that you haven't thought of before as you're going through the text. Like I'm working on Mark now. And so I'm reading Mark chapter 11 and I'm realizing what is this about donkeys? You know, donkeys, um, Jesus gets this donkey that's never before been ridden. What's the significance of that? I wonder if donkeys are like horses that they have to be broken first. And so I, I contacted a friend who is a, like a horse scientist. <laughs> he, he, um, he said, that's interesting. So he gave me some reading material and I went and read up on it. And right now I'm reading up on figs because uh, there's a lot of interesting things about the cursing of the fig tree that knowing something about fig trees helps me understand better, like about the uh, first crop of figs, the brebas as they're called versus the you know, the, the kind that wasn't on the fig tree yet and wouldn't be expected yet. Well, but there weren't any brevas on it either. Um, there, there are all sorts of, I mean, that's, that's in some other commentaries too, but um, knowing about the root system, you know, so when the roots are dried up, what can I say about the roots? Some of that is just of interest. It's not, it doesn't change the meaning of or the understanding of the text, but there are a lot of things that people in the first century would have taken for granted. You know, when Eutychus falls out the window in Acts chapter 20, hmm, where would this window have been on the wall that he's sitting on the window? How big would the window have been? You know, those were things I wanted to, to research. So, um, and for those things, you, if you don't find them in the commentary literature, because a lot of commentaries, they just copy what other commentators said. You know, and I'm, I don't want to just duplicate what's already been done. If it's already been done well enough, just refer somebody to that. I want to give something new uh, something additional when I when I do the work. So, um, so and anyway, once I have things in order, now now I can do it on computer. I can uh, file everything. Uh, I have the data. I get it in in the sequence. Well, not sequence, but certain topics. So, I can write a rough draft. Other things I'm ADHD, as you probably can tell. So other things will come into my mind as I'm working on this. And I'll just make myself a note to follow up on that later so I don't lose my train of thought and uh, just be working from the data that I have and, uh, and the other things. Then later, that's the hardest part, the writing the rough draft. The second hardest part is the next one, going in, filling in all of those things that uh, I left myself notes to fill in on, which means I have to go, uh, let's see, where do I have that in my research file? Uh, I've got too much. And so, um, and then, what's easier is going back and after I have enough distance from it that I I'm reading it like somebody who isn't already inside the, the text. Hmm, let me make sense of, of this that I have here. Let me organize it better. And then editing is easier and indexing. You can, well, indexing references for the Acts commentary took me 14 months of 60 hour weeks because I had like tens of thousands of, of references, but that was uh, the first books I did it, it was terrible. I was, I was walking down the hall indexing room numbers. I mean, it was terrible, but, um, but I found out it's such a mindless task that it, once I know what I'm doing, I can, I can listen to the radio, it's the most, relaxing thing, uh, relaxing stage. Anyway.
thank you for that. That's very helpful. Uh, getting just a picture of what it what it looks like for you to be doing all that research and it's always been very helpful to me to to consult one of your commentaries and see all the the resources and primary sources in the footnotes has been a very helpful guide to me uh, I, final question for most of us that are here are either master's students or phd students and i, I wonder if you could tell us what are some of your big picture goals when you're doing your research? And do you have any criteria that you use to decide whether a project has potential or not? I think some of us worry about getting too far into a project and then realizing there's nothing there for us to do or should we keep going on or do we abandon ship? Uh, so do you have any criteria to help you decide on those things? Yeah, I mean, I want it to be something that will be useful that will shed light on something. But I also want it to be um, something that hasn't been done. Uh, not, I mean, not, not all our contributions have to be things that haven't been done. You can't write a commentary just, on, just giving things that haven't been done because it wouldn't be really a commentary. It wouldn't help you understand enough because a lot of this stuff has already been done. But, um, but certainly for dissertations and for uh, normal scholarly articles, you want to contribute things that haven't been done. So. I'm, I'm getting a better sense of that these days as I'm looking at texts and saying, hmm, this, this is something that nobody's commented on. Normally, things that haven't been commented on are interdisciplinary. So some of that is by approaches, but some of it is also by fields of knowledge. When I, back when I started, there still was a lot that needed to be done on early Judaism in the New Testament. Um, but I found there was still more to be done on a lot of uh, first century Greek and Roman things that hadn't been done. And now I'm finding areas where, uh, where there are things that need to be done that I need to actually go to other kinds of disciplines like studying fig trees or <laughs> you know, um, areas where I'm not super competent, but there are resources that can help, uh, help me get some information that'll help me understand those things. When my students come in and they wanna do dissertations, at first I was hands off, like what, what you wanna do, you can do, provided it hasn't been done before. And, you know, but some of them, I mean, they, they were like, one, one student wanted to do a, a new approach to the new perspective. I'm like, you and a hundred other people, I mean, that, <laughs> Uh, everybody's trying to do that. You, uh, I didn't end up advising that one, but it's good to, uh, anyway, I'm more hands-on now because students have come, well, what about this? That's been done. What about this? That's been done. What about this? That's been done. So during our, our coursework, I'll say, okay, that's a good paper. That's, that's something that hasn't been done. You could develop that in a dis dissertation. And I'll throw out some ideas like this has never been done. This has never been done. Um, not that I always know. I mean, the student still needs to check. There may be something done that I, I've never heard of. Um, but also I try to be careful because some of the things that have never been done, there's a good reason why they've never been done. You know, some things can't be done well. Uh, they're just absurd. And so uh, have, having some knowledge of the field Something I did, and I wouldn't, well, it's not necessary today, but back in the, uh, up till about 1990, I had, I had gone through the hard copy of New Testament abstracts year by year and read through and taken notes. So I knew kind of the shape of New Testament scholarship at that point. Today, you just, you can go into New Testament abstracts, all the recent ones are, you know, <laughs> you, you can pick whatever topic or passage you're looking for and it'll pull all the recent ones up. Um, but knowing something about what's been done, that's why it's good to have somebody who knows something of the contours of the field, knows what's been done. And sometimes, but my, my advisor was really great on this, D. Moody Smith. When I was <clears throat> writing my proposal, he said, well, okay, 
here's your thesis. And I said, what happens if I get into it and the, based on the research, I find out that the proposal is wrong? He said, but then you just change the proposal at the end. <laughs> you just, um, <clears throat> it, it, your introduction will say, okay, this was the research proposal. This is what I found. It didn't lead to this conclusion. It led to this conclusion. Maybe not as exciting as what I'd hoped, but uh, as long as it, it the, the big thing is to be honest with, with where your research leads. And, and also to be, to recognize, as Paul put it, we know in part, we prophesy in part, there, there's more that we don't know than that we do know. And we can know enough often to say to a really high degree of probability that a certain thing is true. But we just need to keep in mind, there are other things we don't know. <laughs> great, thank you very much. It sounds like uh, your students have a great supervisor who's helping guide them through these difficult issues. Uh, I will pass it off for our final question to Melissa. Final question is um, just one that we got a lot when we were asking our students to submit questions on our group. Um, and they asked, what advice would you give to some who are concerned that after they finish their PhD, there will be no jobs for them? So for the young, young students looking toward doctoral work, I know it's a concern I've heard many, many times. Um, so just curious what your advice might be for that. There's there are plenty of places where people are desperate. Now, <clears throat> it may make a difference in terms of your uh, denominational orientation, your theological tradition, <clears throat> and, and also your willingness to be culturally versatile. But I mean, there are places all over the world that are desperate. If your um, calling is to teach, there are places where the church is growing at a massive rate and um, they're great on evangelism, but they don't have enough teachers in their Bible schools. <clears throat> Some of those you'll have to learn another language, but I mean, in a number of those cases, their language is you have to learn for your doctoral work anyway. So um, <clears throat> Francophone Africa is really underserved, for example. Now, <clears throat> um, so you can start your teaching experience there. <clears throat> you can always, um, there are plenty of adjunct positions. You can't live on adjunct positions, but um, and, and of course you can publish your, your work. Um, the, church, the church does need pastor scholars too, but, but I think th there was a time when I almost moved to Nigeria because the students there were so hungry for, for the learning, so hungry for the information that I could give. And, and, and I, I just, if my main call were teaching in person, I would have done it. But because so much of my teaching ministry is through my writing, uh, the particular place I was in Nigeria, the power was off so often <laughs> uh, that I, I, uh, I wouldn't have been able to get published as much. So uh, part of it depends on, on the nature of your calling. But if, it's, if, if you're called to teach, there's just, there are so many openings. Now the ideal in most of those places will be for teachers who know the culture, but at the moment there's still, uh, even if you're not from that culture, there's still, there's still a lot of places. You do need to be ready for uh, hard knocks along the way uh, in teaching and dealing with academia but you get used to those during your dissertation anyway. And most of you have gotten used to those in school by now anyway. So it's just, some of them will be in different contexts, but um, after a while you, you get habituated seeing that there are many tests along the way, but the Lord is faithful. And if the Lord has called you to it, the Lord is gonna make the way. It may not be exactly where you expect starting. I wanted to teach in a university, uh, secular university when, when I was at Duke I just loved that context but I can't keep my mouth shut I love to preach when I teach and so you know, it's good I'm in a seminary but the Lord knew I when I started teaching in a seminary I was like this is not the right place for me all my students are older than I am but 
it's all right. It worked out. I, I, I eventually got older. So. Dr. Keener, if I could ask you one bonus question. Sure. Is there anything that we missed or anything that you wish you knew as a master's student or as a PhD student? Oh boy, there's all sorts of things I wished I knew, but actually maybe the biggest thing I wished I'd known, it was the thing I was staking my life on, but I, I'm not sure I trusted it as much as I, in retrospect, I could have, and that is God's faithfulness. What he put in my heart, what he called me to do, he actually has fulfilled and is fulfilling. And at the time, it was just a dream. I didn't even know if I could get into a, a PhD program because, or at least a, a PhD program I could get a job from because I, um, after I became a Christian, I went to a Bible college. And then from the Bible college, I went to a seminary that was in the process of accreditation. So I look back, I'm like, well, the day before I was gonna call Duke and tell him I couldn't come because I had no, I had no financial support there, um, the Lord provided the money. And he's just taking care of things step by step. And I wish I could say it was because of my great faith, but it's, it's because of his calling. Um, he looks out for you. He's faithful in what he's called you to do. And just keep, keep following his calling and um, Tests come along the way, but what he's given you, he will, he will use. And it may not be the way you envision it. I, I thought I would, you know, as a young Christian, I thought I'll be out preaching to tens of thousands of people. Uh, but the way the Lord has given it to me is much more suited to my gifts, my calling, and my being an extreme introvert, so hey. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much for just being here with us and sharing all that you have. I know that I've gleaned a lot from this time, not only academically, but spiritually. And what you said at the end for me personally, is just really encouraging as we navigate as students, what comes next and where's this all going? And there's so many questions that come with this season of life. So. Yeah, we're just really grateful for, for your time. And um, I'll pass the mic, the invisible mic, one last time, uh, just here to Kevin, so he can close out our time together. I just want to say thanks once again to Dr. Keener. Uh, when we were imagining this interview, we wanted, number one, a great scholar, but not just a great scholar. We wanted to interview a great scholar whose work is motivated by a love for the Lord a love for scripture and a love for the church. And Craig, your life and career has modeled that beautifully for us. And we are just thrilled that you would take the time to share your wisdom with us. So I know this is a webinar and we can't see the audience, but Craig, just imagine a big Zoom audience sharing their appreciation uh, for you because I know they all wish that they could. Thank, thank you so much for having me. It's such a privilege for me to be with you. And we should also say thanks to Beth, who, as Jesse said, has been a champion for the student group uh, from day one. And also to President Lynn Kohick and the entire IBR board for their support. Thank you all so much. And thanks also to our audience. We, we pray that this has been beneficial for you and that you've picked up some nuggets of wisdom that will stick with you throughout your entire careers. And we're planning more events like this, hopefully in person in, in San Antonio next year, and uh, maybe even more online events like this as well. So uh, to stay informed about any future events, we encourage you to join our Facebook group and or follow us on Twitter. On Facebook, you can find us at facebook.com slash groups slash IBR students, one word, no spaces or dashes. And on Twitter, you can find us at IBR students. Again, just one word. And I'll, I'll put those links in the uh, Zoom chat. Uh, we also welcome you to email us at students at ibr-bbr.org or to message Melissa, Jesse, or myself on social media. We'd love to hear your feedback on this interview. And really, we'd just like to hear your feedback on anything related to IBR students, ideas, suggestions, anything. The three of us on the committee are here to serve you 
in the group and to represent students to the IBR leadership. So we'd love to hear how we can best do that. And so once again, thanks to Craig and all who are involved in the group. And uh, let me close us with a blessing. Father, thank you so much for Craig that he would uh, spend this time with us and thank you for the lessons that you have taught him through the years. We pray that uh, those of us who are listening would uh, take those to heart and apply them in our lives so that uh, we can bear much fruit in kingdom ministry of serving the church through teaching ministry, through research ministry, uh, in our academic vocation. Help us, help each of us to, to faithfully live up to that calling. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all so much. And I'll put that, uh, those uh, links in the Zoom chat. Hi, Kevin. I was going to tell Melissa, but I guess I'll just relay to you. Um, the recording is stopped now, but should be uh, available to you guys soon.